and I'm back after having gone through the interior check, just making sure that the switch positions as they are set up here at the beginning match the switch positions I'm checking for as called out by the manual, so everything does match that I can see, so there should be no surprises as we go through and perform these procedures. And for this segment, I've switched back to track IR. I'm going to alternate between the two wherever appropriate as we go. And since the next few things coming up are very cockpit intensive, it's, well, it's definitely not the most enjoyable way to do this, but this will hopefully give a more direct view of what's going on here in the cockpit. Now, there is one little point in the middle of the interior inspection that requires some sort of action. Now, down here under pedestal, step one is UHF radio as required. So my UHF radio down here on the pedestal is set to 267, that's the tower frequency, and since I don't have any other flight members and no other aircraft airborne to communicate with, I'm going to leave it set to this and just be in contact with the tower. Now one other little feature that I noticed down here is that, and I'll show this edited in after the fact, but in the mission editor we have a tab that we can go to to designate what the preset frequencies are, numbered 1 through 20, we can type in a number there and that's what this little dial right here will set it to if we go with a preset channel with this selector and preset and then just using this switch to manipulate it. This might happen on other aircraft, it's just the first one that I've ever noticed it at, but we get here displayed in the cockpit the numbers that are set in the editor. That's really, really neat. That should be, if that's not the standard already for other aircraft with a similar radio, yeah, that's very neat. Other developers should steal that idea because that is very, very handy. And I'm going to go off presets for, well, probably for the remainder of the series since it's so easy to see and remember what they are now. Okay, so UHF radio was set, and then step three is TACAN as required. Now, the TACAN panel for navigation is right down here, and if I go to the F10 view, and I could have also looked at this as part of the mission planning, I will in the future, but we see our aircraft here on the ramp at Tbilisi, and then out here, and this will be to our left and in front of us, we have on channel 25 a TACAN station. So I just come down here to the panel, set the selector to 25, X-ray, and then when I go to transmit receive, or TR, it's going to pick up on the TACAN signal and give us on our HSI, there will be a small needle or a small arrow that's going to point to the TACAN station, and we're also going to get, if we're in range, a distance to the station displayed up there to the left. So we'll see that once we get power on the aircraft. We don't have anything up and running just yet. Okay, so the rest is just switch position checks until we get right here. It's going to have it start to get things set up for the engine start. Now, fuel boost pump switches left and right. I come down here to my fuel control panel. I have boost pump switches left and right on. Cross feed switch I verify is off. Auto balance switch centered. Now, this is going to, once we get airborne, give us the ability to balance the left and right fuel tanks or fuel systems. The right hand system is actually aft fuel tanks. The left hand system is forward fuel tanks. So we're going to see that work once we get airborne. Okay, canopy jets and T-handle in, safety pin installed. The handle is right there and there's no a safety pin. If it's like the T-38 at least, the pin would just sort of stick straight into the jettison handle. And believe it or not, I've actually investigated two cases where people getting incentive rides in the back seat of a T-38 got to the point where it was time to pull the pin and somehow or another, they just ended up pulling the handle. It, it happened twice in like a three or four month period. And then all it really does is, you know, back here in the inner workings, I forget exactly. Yeah, I think it is a different canopy set up from the T-38. But there's a little, it's just a little explosive squib that fires. And, and well, I guess just to tell the rest of the story, it wasn't even discovered until they got to EOR and they got to the point where it was time to close the canopies. And in this case, it's just basically reach up here to a handle and pull it down manually, and the backseat of your canopy just wouldn't close. They had to abort the mission and taxi back, but yeah, that was what it came down to. Trying to pull the pin, but just either got confused or didn't know how to pull the safety pin. You have to depress a little button on the back, the ball bearings are released, and then the pin slides out. So yeah, it's bringing back some, I guess, interesting uh, memories for me there. Okay, so let's go ahead and press on to battery switch to battery. Now this is going to get power onto the DC direct current systems and we'll dig into electrical here in just a second and then auxiliary intake doors indicator check closed now that's right up here next to the engine instruments that it is in the closed position because both of our auxiliary intake doors which we saw earlier are closed okay generator switches left gen and right gen i want to position these on now doing this now is not going to do anything for us because these are run by the engine and once we get the engine up and running 
the lift generator and right generator lights that we see here on the caution panel are going to extinguish. That's going to happen once power is being supplied off the generators. So that's just presetting those switches. And then compass switch as required, and that's going to be, yeah, right down here actually. Let's see here. So we have directional gyro, magnetic, and then fast slave. I'm going to leave that. Uh, I don't know what I want to set that to, honestly. I'm going to leave it into magnetic for now. And then, I think, if it doesn't tell us more about it as we get into the procedure, I'll come back to this at some point and figure out what that's telling us. I mean, I know that directional gyro is going to have the, probably the compass up here on our HSI, slaved to a directional gyro as part of the, its attitude reference heading system, sort of like a little uh, stabilized gyro system that the aircraft attitude is derived from. Or, I could have it working off magnetic, which is just going to be... Uh, working off a magnetic compass. Well, anyway, we'll, we'll get back to that here in a little bit. Then SST-181X, which I believe that's just some later uh, style aircraft on the U.S. side that have that system. And antenna selector switch as required some aircraft. Now, okay, this one's going to be, I presume, down here. Calm antenna. We have a lower, an upper, and an auto setting, and that's going to be referring to the UHF antenna. The upper one is on the back of the aircraft up on the vertical tail. The lower antenna is right below us, just aft of the radome on the bottom of the aircraft. One of those, I believe it's three, I don't have access to an external view, but I'll show it. One of those uh, antennas, the larger one, is the lower UHF antenna. Then auto is where I'm going to leave it, and what I believe happens there, if it's anything like some other systems I'm familiar with, is that it takes the signal strength being received from both antennas and uses the one with the higher signal strength coming from whatever frequency the UHF system is set to. So I'm just going to leave that in auto. I don't think it's, I really don't think it's modeled, but it's just kind of neat that there's a switch there. Okay, then we get into the right console. We have an oxygen system check. And again, I'm sort of still here in the, you know, like it says up here at the top, the pre-fly check, but everything pretty much before this was just verification of switch positions. So now we're just into actually performing steps. Okay, oxygen system check. So it's going to tell me supply pressure gauge check from 65 to 110. Now, supply pressure, yeah, right there, it says PSI. 65 to 110 is what we need it to be, but, okay, apparently with just battery power on, okay, there we go. Apparently, I actually didn't know that that would need the on switch for the oxygen system, but once you turn it on, we can see our pressure is at a little over 100, so that's within the range, that's good. An oxygen quantity... Indicator check, oxygen quantity is right up here, and we saw that a little bit using the quantity check down here earlier, but yeah, that is a full LOX bottle at 5 liters. And then hoses and connections check, and the actually the hose for the oxygen system is this green one back here. This is what supplies the breathing oxygen, so this little fitting right here actually would connect to a hose that will be attached to the pilot's mask, and the black cord that you see running straight down it is the comm cord for communications. Okay, so operation. We have a warning here for the oxygen system. It is possible for the lever to stop in an intermediate position between off and on. Okay, that's not applicable to, I assume, a simulated system, so I'm not going to worry about that. Supply lever on, diluter lever to the normal oxygen. Okay, we can see that the diluter is in 100% oxygen. I'm going to go back to normal oxygen. And that's just going to provide oxygen at varying rates based on the ambient pressure. So that's obviously not going to use as much as 100% oxygen, which will be burning through the supply uh, faster than at the normal sort of regulated rate. And then emergency lever to normal, and that is in the normal center position. Put on mask and do an operational check. Obviously that's not going to be applicable. But I do have a mask test and an emergency setting right there, so I would imagine that it would just be going to both of those settings and making sure that you can still breathe. And you can see the flow, little blinker right there blinking off and on. And that would happen as the pilot breathes in and out. Just varying pressures in the system from normal breathing are going to actuate this little blinker, the little indicator right there. Okay, so that's a good look at the oxygen system. Actually, let me go to the manual real quick. I'll go Alt-Tab. And let me see if I can find anything else on that. I'll show a diagram or something right here and see if there's anything interesting there I missed. Since, yeah, chances are I'm not going to remember to come back to a lot of these little miscellaneous systems. I'll do them right now while they're fresh in my mind. And I guess the only other thing to add here is that we have a chart in the Dash 1. And let's just say that we fly a mission at 30,000 feet. That's going to give us with a full LOX 
quantity of 5 liters, uh, geez, 11 hours, or actually, no, 23 hours. But of course, at lower altitudes, that's going to be, be less, that's sort of best case, and the lower the altitude, the less duration you get out of it, so, so yeah, yeah, very cool. Okay, so let's go to IFF to standby. Now, the IFF panel is down here below the caution and warning panel. I'm just going to set the switch to standby just because it said to. This system is not going to be modeled. There's no a function to this in DCS. And then it tells us fuel and oxygen system gauge test and quantity check. Now, we already did this earlier, right before we got into the aircraft, but I'll go up to gauge test. Okay, I see the, uh, the fuel gauge and the oxygen gauge coming down. And I get the oxygen light on once the lux quantity gets below a certain point. And I don't get, like really, I don't get a, a like a fuel low caution or warning. I don't dispute that, but yeah, I would have expected something like that on the caution and warning panel. But okay, so that's the gauge test. Now quantity check, and that just resets it to the operating quantity, okay. Okay, so continuing on to interior lights and exterior lights as required, rotating beacon as required. Now one little interesting thing right here is that with the battery on, we have a backup floodlight capability using the engine instruments dial. So even though the floodlight over here has no function, the backup off of battery power is uh, done through the engine instruments. So I have, yeah, I see some more F5s taxiing in out there in front of us. So yeah, I'm going to I just have these preset so that once I get power, AC power, to the lighting on, these will come on. And I'll just press on here, warnings test switch to test. Now this is going to be a test of my caution warning panel. Lights, I think it does all lights in the cockpit. I put it to test. Okay, all lights are on. Okay, yeah, there we go. So like I was saying earlier, fuel, left fuel low, right fuel low, caution lights. So we do get caution lights. I think what it is is just with battery power, whatever a circuit is controlling these two lights for left and right fuel low isn't active so these will work once we get AC power on. I'll check that once we get the generators on. I think they will come on as expected. Now another little interesting thing right here is the fire lights. I can see that I have four bulbs and it's going to tell us I think actually maybe it's the next page. Yeah there we go. Note all four fire warning light bulbs must illuminate during the test. Failure of any bulb or filament may indicate an inoperative fire detector system. So yeah left and right engine or bay fire detection system lights are good and then all the other lights around the cockpit for the gear handle the landing gear position the caution everything else AOA indexer is on now I just release the switch and they go off okay good and then tr circuit breakers check so we have three really big main banks of circuit breakers here one on the left one on the center pedestal then one around on the right and all the person we checking right there is that the circuit breakers are not extended or popped, which would happen if there were too much amperage being pulled through the system. You know, they, all these have like a, like these are seven and a half amp circuit breakers. So if seven and a half amps is exceeded due to a short in one of the circuits or other condition, like yeah, there's 15 amp, five amp, then the circuit breaker, let me see, weapon power lift inboard, yeah, I can do that, will pop out. Usually there's either a red or a white indicator right there to make it more visible, but these are black, no big deal. And you would know at that point that something is wrong. Okay, yeah, there's a there's that F5 that just texted in. Okay, so that's good. So okay, now we're getting there. Now we're into before starting engines.